Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This will be part 309. And the topic of our lesson today is reality shift. We want to focus on the definition of reality shift, the concept of reality shift. <clears throat> Scripture teaches God is not a person. God is a reality personified, a state of existence. Persons are created beings. God is not a created being. He transcends his creation. Yes. So of course that's going to raise the question for those at home. Since we understand that he's a reality personified, why do we hear the pronoun, I believe you say, he and him? When you look at that, it's in italics. Mm. It means, wasn't well, in the original script. We're going to show an example of that. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, in addition to what you just said, yes. he is a reality personified, but he is the one who has created all the other realities. Yes, we're going to go into that also. When you, when they asked Jesus who he was, Jesus would always reply, not I am Jesus. He would say, I am. He presents himself as a state of existence mm. consistently. And we see some examples of this. Turn to Revelation, first chapter, verse 8. Revelation, the first chapter, verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. He transcends all existences. He stands outside of time, space. He is the unmoved mover. Should we understand, therefore, that the word Lord itself transcends gender? No, uh, because you can have the word Lord means kurios applied to an individual. Lord this, Lord, you should know that. Well, I do, but it's not Lord applied acting, to a female, is it? Well, no, it's not applied to lady acting, is it? <laughs> no, because of gender. <laughs> exactly, that's the point I'm making. So but in this respect, he transcends gender. Is the point. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, turn to John. John 8, verse 58. Gospel of John, 8th chapter, verse 57. That's okay. We're talking to him about Abraham. And I look at Abraham as a patriarch, which he is. He's the father of uh, the Israelite nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, they say that Jesus basically, well, Abraham is up here and you're down here. Mm -hmm. Jesus corrects them. Matter of fact, we're going to start verse 56. Is your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. He's a state of existence. He's not a person. Should we understand also in the use of the am, therefore, there is no beginning and end. He's, he's bringing that into... Perpetual yes. existence. Yes. They didn't like that. They tried to stone him. Why? Because they knew what he was saying. Mm. He's claiming to be God. 
Let's go on. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they believed immediately, but refused to accept the, the well, scribes and Pharisees I'm talking. No, they didn't believe it was God. They believed it was Messiah, which was a representative of God. They don't understand the, the concept of... Uh, he, he says, I am. Yeah. Do they believe he is? No. Okay, that's what we're talking no, about. No, I'm saying, but they believed he was the Messiah. Okay. They said, He's, this is the one that was promised. Right. Get rid of him. Right. But they couldn't comprehend the Messiah as God. They thought the Messiah was a deliverer, somebody who was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. The human race has never entered into the concept of who God is. They believed he was a prophet, right? Yes. <clears throat> but when we read the scripture, we have to read it on your own. With Holy Spirit giving you comprehension. Because if you sit at the foot of a man, you're not going to get revelation knowledge. Because you're only going to get what that man is capable of giving you. Mm. You have to sit at the foot of the Holy Spirit to get the fullness of the revelation of God's Word. So let's go on. <clears throat> we said that God is a state of existence, a reality, personified. In that respect, He transcends everything. Apart from God, beyond God, nothing exists. Everything that exists, whether it's heaven, hell, earth, the dawn star hierarchy, angels, archangels, they all exist within the reality of God. Turn to Acts, 17th chapter. When you get there, verse 28. Paul understood this concept. He understood it intimately. Acts 17, 28. For in Him we live and move and have our being. Now the word being comes from a Greek term, emi, e-i-m-i, -I, which means existence. Mm. So he's saying, in him we live and move and have our existence. <clears throat> As certain also of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. So he tries to, be, tries to present the reality of God. Now, these are philosophers. These are the people that have uh, been the movers and shakers of our current um, university system. Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, they hold these guys up to all sorts of uh, uh, reverence. They couldn't deal with what Paul was saying. They walked away from him, left him alone on Mars Hill because they couldn't conceive of the concept, Paul's concept of God. Let's go on. Scripture teaches, in the period called the end of the age, which is the period we're entering into, <clears throat> the Father will separate existence into realities of good and realities of evil. That what we find, God is consistently separating good from evil. Turn over to Genesis, the first chapter. Genesis, the first chapter, when you get there, verses 2 to 4. And <clears throat> earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. <clears throat> now, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. 
So we find that the light is diffused in the darkness, because everything is darkness. What is the first thing that God does? Verse 4, God saw the light, that it was good. God divided the light from the darkness. He separates light from dark. Darkness represents evil. Light represents good. In eternity, everything is coached in terms of light. Light is the element in which life exists. Here, in temporality, you have what's called matter. Matter is temporal, temporary. What God is doing, what He's going to do as we enter into the age, or the end of the age, He's going to separate light from darkness, good from evil. Good people from bad people consistently until the end of the age. We're going to see some examples of that. The first thing that you're going to find out, what we've been talking about is Ephesians. So in Ephesians, first chapter, you. verse 10. Let me yes. ask this question. Please. So it says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, so that there be light, and there was light. And God saw light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Now, that's the first thing he does with the light, but we know that God is light himself. Yes. So did he separate at that point from the darkness, or was he already separated from the darkness? He's beyond it. Yes. You know, there's a part in the Bible, I don't know exactly where it's at, but it says where God actively purifies himself. There's a scripture that says that. Uh, well, he doesn't purify himself. He doesn't need to. He's the essence of purity. Right, but there's actually there's actually a scripture. That there's a scripture that, 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 that talks about we purify ourselves as He is pure. I don't because know if that's the body one. of Christ, maybe. Through, I mean, as we are part with the body of Christ. Yes, it's talking about us consistently needing to be purified because we have a corrupted nature and we have a godly nature, mm -hmm. and we have to uh, God does separate the two so that. We consistently stay in the godly nature, which is light. The scripture says, you are light, walk in the light, as he is in the light, and we have fellowship one with another. It's First John. Walk in the light, yeah. It talks about walking in darkness, being deceptive. The individual who walks in darkness cannot conceive of things objectively because the darkness clouds his ability to comprehend true reality. Only in light can you see things as they are. That's why we have the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit lets us see things as they actually exist. Satan, who is the prince of darkness, puts darkness in man's mind so he doesn't see things as they are. He sees things as Satan wants him to see things. He sees them subjectively. That's why you have people they go into a state of fallen spirituality and not realizing that they've ever even fallen. They think that they're still in the light because they're deceptive. They've received deception. They can't see things as they are anymore. They see things as they appear to be. You ask a Christian who's lost his commitment why he's doing things and he can give you a reason for it because in his own mind he's justified. That's a darkness. Right. It's just like the people that are practicing all of the, the acts, that, the sexual per per perversions, they can no longer know the truth because they've right. chosen to eat the lie. Yeah, that's right. Lie. They're surrounded by a reality of deception. <clears throat> that's why we have to consistently fight to maintain our freedom because we live in a world of darkness. And the enemy is using every trick he can to try to get the individual to be deceived to go into the darkness so he can be controlled. Here we see God separating the light from the darkness. He's consistently doing that. In the age that we're entering into, he's going to separate those of light from those of darkness. Ephesians, the first chapter, verse...
in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So what you have here, God is going to gather all that pertain to Jesus in one connected unity, whether they're in heaven or whether they're on earth. Prior to that time, things are separated. Why? Because of the fall of Lucifer, because of the fall of man, you have separation. At this point, God's going to gather together. Paul talked about the gathering consistently. Turn to the book of 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 2nd chapter. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. So He is going to come and He is going to gather those that belong to Him, connecting them with those that belong to Him in the heavens and those that belong to Him in the earth. Earth is not a planet. We have been told that this is a sphere in which it's 24,000 miles in circumference, 14,000 miles in diameter, and you have continents. The Bible doesn't give you that picture. The Bible gives you a picture of the Earth as being a matrix. Events taking place on the Earth, on the surface, and in the interior. A consistent habitation of races exist within the earth and beyond the earth. When the Lord comes, He's going to gather in one all these that pertain to Him. All that is within Him are going to be connected. Now in our last lesson, we discussed that, gave some examples of that. We're just going to briefly recapitulate, <coughs> go to Revelation 5th chapter. At the time of the rapture, when everything is gathered together, you're going to have two great realities. Reality of light, reality of darkness. Habitations of dwelling in light, habitations of the dwelling in darkness. Now, Revelation, the fifth chapter. Verse 2 to 3. The Lord stands by the throne. The Father has a book in His hand which is sealed up with seven seals. And in verse 2, it says, I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon, this is telling you that these have all been gathered. They are connected in Christ by the time of the rapture. Nobody is worthy. Well, they're all righteous, but nobody is worthy to open the book but Jesus. Now, having said that, we go to the next principle in our lesson. Scripture indicates this would include realities 
of the heavens and earth and in neither habitations of the subterranean region. In other words, they are all going to be gathered together in one in Christ because there are <coughs> there are habitations, there are beings who are Christ in every area of that habitation. So they're going to be connected. They're separated currently because of the fall of the creation. The Lord is going to restore everything, but before He does, He is going to divide the good from the bad, the light from the dark. Revelation, the fifth chapter, verse 13. Is that the different sheepfolds that you're referring to? Yes. Is that what that means? Or? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Oh, that makes sense. It makes better sense. <laughs> yes. Especially now because we're mentioning the interdimensional beings. They're actually... Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. So you see the regions that have been connected in Christ giving him glory. On the earth, under the earth, in the heavens, in the sea, in the subterranean regions, all of these are his. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, that's that makes good sense more than anything now. Yeah. Turn to the Gospel of John, 10th chapter. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> Jesus spoke of this himself. First chapter, John? 10th chapter. John 10, 16. John 10, 16. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. The fold is referring to is Israel. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Currently, they're separated. In the times ahead, there's going to be a great gathering. It's going to be a time of great distress, a time of tremendous upheaval, a time in which true reality is going to be revealed to the human race. <clears throat> it's been talked about, but not understood. Turn to the book of Psalms, 50th chapter. Here you have a picture of the Lord's coming and making uh, the gathering. Okay. Psalms, 50th chapter. <clears throat> Starting in verse 1. To verse 5. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken, and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, he's talking about heavenly Zion, the perfection of beauty God hath shined. A God shall come and shall not keep silence. Remember what he says, they shall hear my voice. A fire shall devour before him, it shall be very tempestuous round about him. It's talking about his glory. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather 
Gather, gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. This is the great gathering. Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians. He talks about it in Ephesians, the first chapter. It's prophesied here in Psalms. <coughs> it will happen. <coughs> when is it going to happen? Turn to the book of Luke. Gospel of Luke, 21st chapter. Starting in verse 25, down to verse 27. What chapter was that? Luke 21, verse 25 to 27. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There should be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars. Upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, man's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then, and then, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That's Psalms 50. Everybody is going to see him in his glory. He's going to descend in a cloud. He's going to be speaking to gather his saints together. This is going to be what we just read in Ephesians, the first chapter. All things in Christ being connected, whether in heaven, the surface of the earth, or the subterranean regions. Do you have a question on that? Do you have a question on that? Um, when you give us these verses, should I be writing these ones down, or most of them are they're here? Or? They're all there. They're on your so left. So I can well, there's some scriptures I'm giving you, but that's okay. You can watch it on the video. To help. Okay. And I'll have everything on it. I don't want you to just disrupt the flow so you lose something mm -hmm. of what we're saying. Right. I have the extra ones on the side. Oh, okay. Oh, oh that's good. That's you great. Can just watch it. Okay, thank just you. Right. We call it the Great Gathering. It's going to gather all those that are in Christ and connect them. There's more we can be to be said about that, but we want to go on to the second half of this. There's going to be a gathering of darkness, things of evil also. At this time, the forces of Satan that have been imprisoned since the fall of Satan are going to be released. They're going to come to the surface world. They're going to wipe out this current Adamic order. Human race is going to be deposed. It will never again rule the surface of the earth. It's part of a judgment. Right. In that respect, Darkness is going to be gathered and connected under what's called the Luciferian yes. kings. Scripture indicates the current surface world's metropolises will, like Sodom and Gomorrah, be destroyed, never to rise again. Turn to Jeremiah 25.
Jeremiah 25. You want? We want verse 15 and 16. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I will send thee to drink it. They shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Now, drop down to verse 27. Jeremiah 25, 27. There? Okay. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. So this is a judgment, and who it falls on never rises again. Verse 26, right above it, tells you who's going to be the victim of it. All the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth, and the king of Shishak shall drink after them. King of Sishak is Lucifer, who will establish a Luciferian system after the fall of this Adamic system. <clears throat> the human race is going to experience devastation on a global scale. Yes? Can you just clarify in verse 26 that the kings of the north are second stringers and how they relate to the first string? She, I don't think, understands that. Uh, when Lucifer fell, he was replaced by principalities. These principalities became corrupted. They are currently in the heavens above, giving the body of Christ grief. Paul talks about our, our, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers of darkness, of evil, in heavenly places. That's referring to these individuals here. They're going to fall about the same time that the human race's civilization falls because they're the ones that are basically behind the current order of things. The ones that were imprisoned at the fall of Lucifer are going to come back and take over everything. It's a little difficult, a lot to try to digest at one time. Are you talking about the ones that are in the Euphrates right now? Those ones? Those ones? Well, they get released at the tribulation period. These are the, the, the original individuals that ran the universe before the human race was created. Lucifer corrupted everything. God kicked him out of his post down to the subterranean regions and imprisoned those that were his assistants in the subterranean regions. They're still down there in prison. They're going to be released. When they get released, they're going to come up to the surface of the earth, wipe out the civilization, and take it over themselves. I know that's kind of hard. No, I understand that now. But you'll find it. Turn to Daniel, the seventh chapter. Turn to Daniel, the seventh okay. chapter. Daniel has a vision of four beasts coming up out of the earth. He's told that the beasts represent kings and kingdoms. Non-human kings and kingdoms. Daniel, 7th chapter, pick it up, verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms. The word diverse there means altered. 
because it will not be ruled by humans. It's going to be ruled by <coughs> fallen intelligences. Great. <laughs> and shall devour the whole earth, shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. <coughs> Literally, it's going to section the earth into provinces over which the Luciferian kings will rule during the era of the beginning of sorrows on into the tribulation period. What will happen, these individuals are going to be deemed gods. And they will be ruled over by the human race. I mean, they will rule over the human race. You see that in... Turn to... Uh, Yeah. <laughs> you were warned. Yeah. Turn to chapter 11, Daniel 11. <clears throat> this is giving you a picture of these guys literally ruling the earth. Starting in verse 36, Daniel 11. <clears throat> Daniel 11, starting right. in verse 36. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the kings, talking about the beast, Revelation 13. The king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. Talking about the father here and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. <clears throat> Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. He's not going to see from a human perspective. He's not going to see beauty uh, between, uh, as a human would see women. He's going to see them as basically things to, to be used or abused. That's why it's called the beast nor regard any god he shall magnify himself above all but in his estate shall he honor the god of forces and a god whom his fathers knew not shall he honor <coughs> with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange god whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and he shall cause them to rule over many and to divide the land, where land is earth, for gain. So this will be a time in which the human race is in uh, egregious uh, uh, polytheism. Everybody's worshipping a God. Everybody. No exceptions. If you miss the rapture, then this is the destiny of the human race. By the time that the beast makes his appearance, everyone is going to be worshipping a god. When he makes his appearance, he's just going to exalt himself above every god that everyone else has worshipped. They're going to worship him first, and then the god that they've been used to worshipping. So it gives you an idea of how this thing is going to <coughs> become totally destitute of anything dealing with God, God's way, God's will. It's going to be turned over totally to the Luciferians that are thoroughly corrupt. Having said that, it's part of the division of light and darkness. You're going to have all in Christ is connected. It will be protected from this. All who are not in Christ are going to come under this influence. <clears throat> You're saying you're talking about the people that got raptured up, mm -hmm. because the ones that get stuck here, there's still the ones that get stuck here at the time of the rapture. They missed the rapture. Mm -hmm. This is what's going to take the place of those that depart. The Luciferians are going to totally take over the earth and turn it into darkness. It's going to be divided into five kingdoms of darkness. And every human being is going to be in one of those kingdoms worshipping a 
guide or more guides. Or they're going to get their head cut off. Well, that's later on. Oh. That's not for not worshiping guides, that's for not taking the mark. Uh, the warning is <clears throat> to seek God while the opportunity still is available to seek Him. People play fast and loose with the grace of God. It's going to come a time when it's not going to be available anymore and they're going to be at the mercy of these corrupted, fallen, non-human, heartless, cruel, criminal-minded, fallen, angelic beings. Sorry to say that, but that's what the Bible says. Give you an example of what this place is going to look like. Turn to Jeremiah, the fourth chapter, verse 23 to 26. This is going to take place at what we call the beginning of sorrows, which is a time we're entering into as we speak. It's a judgment that's pronounced on the world by the Lord. Jeremiah 4, starting verse 23. Okay. There. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void in the heavens and they had no light I beheld the mountains and lo they trembled and all the hills moved lightly I beheld and lo there was no man and all the birds of the heavens were fled I beheld and lo the fruitful place was a wilderness and all 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 the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger Turn to Jeremiah, 25th chapter. The Lord pronounces a judgment on the whole human race. Jeremiah, 25th chapter. Verse 30. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout, as they that tread against all, 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 all the inhabitants of the earth. Everybody in the whole human race that comes under judgment. It's going to come under the judgment that you just read in Jeremiah, the fourth chapter. Everything's going to be wiped out. The cities are going to be desolate. <clears throat> this place is going to look like a ruin. But God's people will not become a victim of this. They're going to be protected. Turn to Jeremiah 23. Verses 3 and 4. You read it. Okay. But I will gather the remnant of my flock. Out of read all it again. Okay. Read it again. Okay. But I will gather the remnant of my flock. Read it again. But I will gather the remnant of my flock. Proceed. Out of the countries where I have driven them 
and bring them back to their folds. And they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed nor shall there be lacking says the Lord that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. Well now that's, that's another one. That's a prophecy pertaining to Israel. What you just read is a prophecy pertaining to the church. Now, turn to the Gospel of Luke, 21st chapter, we're going to close with this. Luke, Luke 21. You get there, we want verses 34 to 36. there? Read it. Okay, so this is the importance of watching. It says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. Stop. Mm -hmm. That day. It's going to happen in one day. Good, that's good, that's right. The rapture, the rapture. Okay. No, this is the gathering. The gathering. He's going to pronounce a judgment on all the human race. Before the rapture. Before the rapture. He said a division. The judgment is going to be pronounced. Those that are under the judgment are going to go into judgment. Those that you just read in Jeremiah 23 are going to be led back to experience the gathering. Finish reading. Okay. This is, um, okay. Mm -hmm. You were in 34. So, 30, for, so um, 30, 35. Yeah, 35. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Right. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. There you have it. Watch that. So this is before the Antichrist is ushered in? Long before. Before the rapture. 